Welcome. It is so good to have you all here today. Wow, I said you all. All right. Whoa. Whew, only been here for like eight months. Whew, that's a problem, y'all. Okay. It is so good to have y'all here today. I'm so loving having you here. I'm so glad to be here. Anyone watching online, thank you for tuning in and taking the time to be part of this. It's just an honor. I can't even begin to say how much an honor it is to be here with you guys. Like I said, I've only been here eight months and it feels like I've been part of this church for the last 10 years. So I appreciate that because that's a, that's a testament to you guys, honestly. Um, to welcome in somebody from the South and say, hey, you're part of us, you're one of us. I really, I really appreciate that. So just really glad to have you guys here. We're gonna do announcements later, but I wanna just take this time to focus in. We're about to jump into worship and something I tell the kids every Thursday night before we have worship time. Worship is not just singing praises to God. It's not just this time. It's the, it's the message time. It's the announcements time. It's doing everything that we're doing to glorify him. Because in this moment, we're coming before his throne and we're praising his name in everything that we do. It's an act of worship to be in this place today. So I encourage you to pray with me real quick as we will then launch into worship. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to be in your presence. Thank you for this opportunity to bow before you. We know you're here, we feel you here. Open up our ears for what you have for us today. Stir in our hearts, move in us, Father. We are your people, ready to praise your name. Amen. Amen. Stand with us this morning. This is a new medley. Uh, you know both of these songs, See a Victory and What a Beautiful Name. But sing with me this morning. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story
you have no equal now and forever god you reign yours is the kingdom yours is the glory yours is the name above all names i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you lord you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turned it for good you turned it for good you took what the enemy meant for evil and you turned it for good you turned it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turned it for good you turned it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turned it for good you turned it for good i'm gonna see a victory i'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you your voices I'm gonna see Guys, this is a new song. Um, I introduced it in youth group a couple months, three, four months ago. <laughs> Anyways, the Lord gave me this song. I truly believe it. It has brought me to tears, and I want to share it with you today. It speaks about the amazing love that God, Christ, has for us. And I hope you guys can feel that love today. When I am a wasteland, you are the water.
to find me What have I done to deserve love like this? What have I find it you search to find me what have I done to deserve love like this
earth has quaked before Moved by the sound of his voice Seas that are shaken and stirred Can be calmed and broken for my regard It is well. 
Dear God, we just thank you this morning for bringing us here together to take a moment, to take a breath and just focus on you, to be together, to be part of the body of Christ. God, this morning, I just want to bring before you those who are hurting, those who want peace in their minds and have a hard time finding it, God. Whether it's depression or anxiety or loneliness, God, no matter what it is, I just pray that you would be near to those people, God, who are struggling. Please comfort them. Please give them hope in the darkness that can be in our minds. Please help us to cling to you. Please help us to hold on to your promise that you love us, God. A verse that I love is, I will not die, but I will live and declare the works of the Lord. God, I just pray that you would help us each to cling to that promise, God, if we struggle to find peace in our minds. And we know that you love each one of us, no matter what might be happening in our minds, in our souls, no matter what we do, God. We know that you love us, and we thank you, God, for loving us. Through no effort of our own, we're just your children. We thank you for that, Lord. And we just we just invite your Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning as we listen to the message. We just pray that you would reveal your truth to us, what you want us to know, what you want us to think about in the coming week. Thank you that we are all works in progress, God, but it's not about our works at all. It's all about your grace. I pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Isn't he so worthy of our worship? Isn't he so worthy of all these wonderful things we sing about him? Sometimes I just have to close my eyes and just imagine being in front of the presence of God the Father as we, his children, join his children all over the world in song and all different kinds of languages. Some of them aren't even awake yet. This world turns out it rotates everybody so God's getting a fresh worship service on the hour every hour throughout his world Nate mentioned that our worship for God is not only in the songs that we sing our worship for God is found in the thousand and one other things that we do every day as a matter of fact the first recorded worship song we know didn't come out until the time of Moses, and we knew that there were lots of people that were worshiping God before that first recorded song. One of the ways that we worship God is by worshiping Him with our minds. Kids, did you know that we worship God with our mouths through singing from our hearts, but we also worship Him with our minds as well? I just very briefly want to mention to you, there's these two ways that we're going to be worshiping God, and they're by way of two announcements. One is we love to be generous and give to others because God has given so much to us. Every year we participate in Operation Christmas Child, which is a way for us to provide gifts for kids all around the world for, by families that don't have the ability to provide those things for them. So you may have noticed when you came into our sanctuary, we've got these uh, Christmas boxes. You pull one of those, they've got instructions inside that, fill it with good stuff. And then on November 7th, we're actually going to have a packing party because we have additional things that we need help um, gathering together. So I'll have more information about that in the weeks coming up. I have a brief video that I'd like for us to show right now that has to do with how we can worship God through the gift of generosity. Three, two, count of demons in opening the shoe boxes. They're so excited. I mean, it's just incredible. 
kids are so excited, giving them a gift good in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless. And God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one. So I know the video was a little crackly, but if you didn't hear, so as these gifts are distributed to these children, it's presented with the gospel. So they get the sense that there's a God that loves them, that wants them to have good gifts, and the gospel is presented there as well. So please grab one or more shoe boxes and stuff those with some of the goodies that are needed there. The second thing I wanted to mention is we worship God with our minds. Um, we are going to be starting our Old Testament survey class beginning in January. My friends, God's Word is worth studying. It's worth studying. When you take an Old Testament survey class, what that does is it goes into each of the books of the Old Testament. It goes about how it was written, when it was written, to whom it was written. It goes of an overview of how every book of the Bible points toward Jesus. This is the same textbook that you would use if you were in Bible college. Okay? We do not take it easy here at the Journey Church. We want to grow up people that know the Word that can study the Word so that they can be more effective in the ministry God calls them into. So I wanted to mention to you, beginning in January, and I'll be talking about this again probably every week until then, about this class. I'm going to leave this book out on the table out there so you can look it over and see if this is something that you'd like to study with us. Those are our two announcements for today. And now let's pray, and we'll go into our word for this morning. God, our Father, we come to you by the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. I pray that you will give us quick intellects, that you'll give us willing hearts to listen, that you will give us studious approach to your word, that we will be like the noble Bereans that studied your word to see if the things that were told to them were true. I pray that for this group here. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, kids, you guys are dismissed. Could you meet Bill McCulley out through those double doors out there? He's putting his hand up in the air. There he goes. My friends, we are about to go down a path that is going to feel like you are going at the speed of light. Okay, we're going to do something we don't normally do here. I've talked with you about the difference between the teaching of the word and the preaching of the word. The teaching of the word talks about what God's word says and breaks it down and you go into the meanings of it and all those kinds of things. And the preaching of the word is what does God have for his people from his word today? We're going to do both. The reason for this is because this message that I'm going to preach, it may seem like it's coming out of left field. You may say, what does a person have the right to tell me what to do in this area of my life? And that's why we need the teaching of the word first, because what we're going to learn today is that God calls each of us to submit ourselves to authority. And there's a variety of authorities that he's told us to submit ourselves to. So what we're going to do is we're going to go fast, okay? We're going to do about 15 to 18 minutes of teaching the word. Then I'm going to give you like a 90-second break, okay? You're going to get up, you shake your head out, shake your arms out, shake your feet out. We're going to sit back down, and then we're going to go into the preaching of the word for another 15 to 18 minutes, all right? We're moving at the speed of light, people. The good news here is that all of the things that I'm covering, the texts, the notes, are all in your handout for today. If you didn't get one of those, we'll have them out by the front there. Here's what I'm hoping you're going to do. I'm here, I'm hoping that during the teaching of the word, you're going to be like hair blown back, like what is this guy talking about? And I'm hoping that you're going to take that handout home with you and sometime over the next two days, take your Bible yourself. Go and look at what I'm saying and see if any of it's true. See if any of it makes sense. I want for you to study the word for yourself. So I've got all my notes for the teaching of the word, and I've got um, all the Bible references there as well. Okay, you ready? Does so everybody come like this? Come your seatbelt? No, actually, it's a five-point harness. We need to click in like this. All right, here we go, everybody. 
We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Did I tell you we're going to be going fast? We're going to be going fast, everybody. Beginning in verse 12. This is the Apostle Paul uh, reaching out to the Corinthians. The Corinthians are a church that's famous for sexual immorality. Okay, That's a big thing in their town. So he's writing to them and he says, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. Listen to these words. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service. Underline, highlight, write a star next to it. Um, Take a big sharpie and do a big circle around it. The sphere of service God himself has assigned to us a sphere that also includes you. Okay? So the Apostle Paul says, buckle up, I've got some instructions for you. And the reason for that is because you are part of a sphere of authority given to us by God. There are two words that we need to focus in on. The first one is kanon. Can you say kanon? What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like canon, right? So if you're a Star Trek fan, you know that there are certain books, certain movies that are canon, and other ones are just nice ideas that people have. Same thing in the Marvel Universe. You've got canon stuff, and you've got stuff that fits outside of that. Canon most directly refers to like a measuring ruler, something used to measure things. But in this context, it means a definitively bound or fixed space within the limits of which one's power of influence is confined, okay? So what it's saying is you may have a sphere of influence that's in your home, right? That's a sphere of influence. You're in charge of everything that happens within the home. What Paul is saying is that what he's writing to these Corinthians, he's saying you guys fit inside this canon, this measure of influence that God has given to us. The second word there is maritzo. Can you say maritzo? Okay, this is the word when he says apportioned. You see that again if you look there in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We're there in verse 13. We, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but we will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us. That word assigned. This is maritzo. It's translated assigned, and it means apportioned, or it means cut into pieces and distributed. So you've been to a birthday party. You take a birthday cake. They cut it into pieces, and they apportion each person a piece of the cake. That's the same thing that's going on here. So Paul is saying to the people, you guys who I'm writing to in Corinth, He says, you guys are actually part of this assignment. You're part of this sphere of influence that God has cut up, and and you guys are part of what he has assigned to me. Okay, This is beginning the discussion about what we're going to call sphere sovereignty. Can you say sphere sovereignty? Sphere sovereignty. Okay, so this idea of sphere sovereignty says that there are spheres of influence that God has apportioned to people, right? So when Paul says, you're a part of this sphere that God has assigned to me, the question that comes up is, well, are there other spheres? There's a sphere of influence that's assigned to Paul. Are there other spheres? And here's another question. How is it that Jesus can apportion control of the sphere of the church to Paul? Like, he says, okay, God has apportioned it to me. Well, who says he gets to do that? Well, Jesus says that he actually had the authority to do that. In Matthew 28, 18, he says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is saying that all authority on heaven and on earth has been given to him. And so he's going to cut it up and he's going to apportion it into pieces. And the, the leadership of the church of Corinth is the piece that God has apportioned to him, Paul. Right? It's this idea of sphere sovereignty. Now you remember, every week we've been doing the Lord's Prayer together because what Jesus prayed was, Our Father who art in heaven, do you remember what he said? Holy be your name. Then what did he say? He said, Your kingdom come. He said, Your will be done. Where? On earth as it is in heaven. Right? That was Jesus' prayer, is that God's authority, God's kingdom, would come here to earth. 
Remember, we talked over the last couple of weeks about how heaven is not some winter sweater for later. It's not a good thing for later. Heaven is not a retirement community in the sky. Heaven is not a retirement community in the sky. Heaven is best described as a kingdom, and it has effects for now, and it has effects for later. So when we start getting in this fear sovereignty, this term we just described, what this is, this is how Jesus has decided to distribute authority on planet earth. Jesus prayed, our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And this is Jesus, as Matthew 28 said, all authority has been given to me. This is how he has decided to apportion it. And it just so happens that these Corinthians are part of the sphere assigned to Paul. When I was working at Kuiper College... I was a student there as well. We had a chapel. It was this lovely wooden chapel put together by the Voss people. And in this picture, if we can get this picture up, you're going to notice that there's a really large chandelier that's hung out and it's carved out of wood. The president of the college was a beautiful wood artist. He did beautiful wood. He was also beautiful, but it was more about the wood art was beautiful. Um, if you can kind of see it, it almost looks like a star or like a compass or something like that. It's backlit, and right around that really light-colored wood, he has a quote from a theologian called Abraham Kuyper. And in this quote, it's this beautiful quote, it says, There is not one square inch of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry. And then in the middle of it, it says, Mine. So it's backlit, so every time you walk in, it's almost like a reverse silhouette. Mine is written on the floor in light, and every time you walk in through that chapel, it's basically reminding you that you are his. But Abraham Kuyper was one of the first people to articulate this theology of sphere sovereignty. And what he said, and I think he's right, I think he got it from Paul here, is that there are many different spheres of authority in this world. Okay? We're going to go over four of them. There are probably others, but we're going to go over four of them. And each of these has a scriptural example. So the first one we're going to begin with is in Romans chapter 2, verse 15. It'll be up there on the screen. And again, this is all in your handout. All these are written down, so I want you to try to hang with me as opposed to trying to frantically keep up with us here. Romans chapter 2, verse 15. They, speaking about... The, being out, uh, Gentiles, they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. The first level of sphere sovereignty is the individual. Right? God didn't make you a robot. God didn't make you a Pinocchio a puppet with strings. You have a conscience that was written on your heart that tells you the difference between right and wrong. The first level of sphere sovereignty is the individual. The individual is bound by conscience, but that is informed by a whole bunch of different people, right? Like, who informed your conscience growing up? Parents? Who else? Teachers? Absolutely. Therapists? <laughs> Good one. Other family members, culture, if you were a Christ follower, the Holy Spirit informed that conscience, right? So as an individual, you have a sphere of authority. It's informed by the Holy Spirit. It's informed by family, by the church, by the laws of the nation you grew up in. We'll call that the state. The scope of that, like, can I come to Diane and start picking her hands up and start doing like this with her, right? We'd have to have a prearranged conversation before I could do that. Because right? she's a sovereign individual, and so am I. Right? My sovereignty of myself does not extend to Dan. It doesn't extend to Katie. Each of them are sovereign individuals with whom we need to have a conversation, and we're bound by conscience. That's the first level. Right? But there's also discipline that goes on at the individual level. Right? Have you ever had to discipline yourself to focus in on like a fitness regime or focus in on studying something? Or have to admit that you did something wrong, right? 
There's a level of discipline even at the individual level. But that's only the first level of sovereignty. The second level, also ordained by Christ, is the family. So the first sphere is individual. The second sphere is the family. Listen to Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. The word says there that children are to obey their parents. This is something that's developed, designed by God. He has given authority to the family structure. And just as an individual is bound by conscience, when you're a part of a family, what are you bound by? You could say rules. You could say love. You're bound together by rules, by love. But what, it, what informs how a family works? Like, does your family work exactly the same way as mine does in all time? Well, no, right? Like, maybe, maybe, so I grew up in a family that had five kids. My mom had to parent us differently than a family that has a single child, right? Um, if you have a, a bunch of children that tend to be a little more timid, maybe you need to encourage them to be more boisterous. If you've got kids that are a little more boisterous, sometimes you need to encourage them to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit more subdued, Right? You parent your children, every family is influenced by the individuals that make it up, right? So each of us, we've got this individual sovereignty. If we were fortunate enough to have a family, then we, we've got this family sphere that we're in. It's informed by the individual, but it's also informed by the community, right? Families do things differently here than they do in France, than they do in South America, right? So... Each family sphere is informed by the state in which it's in part of. It's informed by the church of which it's a part. Now, the scope of the individual, right? Like, you're as an individual, as a sovereign, like, you control what you do with your hands and your feet. You decide when you're an adult, when you're going to go to bed, when you're going to get up, what kind of job you're going to do. The family scope, like, can I go as a father of my family to John Torbett's family and start fathering his children? Well, no, right? There's a, there's a limit to it. You're like, yeah, that doesn't sound bad. No. Right? There's a, there's a family limit. Like, I can't parent kids that are outside of my family. My family is limited to the members that have either been born into it or adopted into it, right? That's the limits of this sphere. I can't go and parent other people's children. I, I li I'm limited in this sphere. Christ has a portion to me influence in the sphere of my family. And you have influence maybe over your adult children, but we know that kind of changes as our, as our children grow up into adults. At some point, they end up having their own sphere that becomes the family, right? So the first sphere is the individual. The second sphere is the family. The third sphere we're going to cover very briefly is the church, right? Look with me at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders, speaking about the church, and submit to their authority. Why? Because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. So Paul says, or the, we, I think it's Paul wrote Hebrews, we don't know who wrote it. But you have the individual level of sovereignty. You have the family level of sovereignty. And then you have the church level of sovereignty. Right? What binds... So if, like, if the individual is bound by conscience, the family is bound by rules, what is the church bound by? Christ by the word of God. Right? Like if I start coming up here with a different sacred book of some kind, I'm kind of preaching out of it, am I still a preacher of the word of God? Well, well no. Right? Like... We are bound by the word of God as the church. We are informed by the Holy Spirit and individuals, right? So like this year, we've got a different set of elders than we did last year. The local church, it's bound by the word of God. It's influenced by individuals and the Holy Spirit. What's the scope of a church? So if like my scope as an individual is just me, my scope as a part of a family is my family, what's the scope of a local church? Well, probably like 
the congregants that go there and go there fairly often. Some churches have, a, have this idea of membership that can be helpful. Like, I can't just go into some other church, step up on their platform, and start preaching to their people, right? Like, Paul says, you, Corinth, have been assigned to me. I, Luke Morgan, have been assigned the Journey Church. And the elders and the, the other pastors of this congregation, this is our sphere that God has entrusted to us. Now, here's where it's going to get sloppy. This is why I mentioned this before we get to the preaching of the word. Okay? Because most of Christ's church have abdicated our responsibility within our sphere of influence. We'll get more into that later. So if the individual is disciplined through habit, through prayer, through confession, through humility, the family is disciplined through correction, encouragement, consistency, right? The discipline within the church is through the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, through accountability, through relationship. And then there's a fourth level of sovereignty, that of the state. So listen to this in 1 Peter chapter 2, 13 and 14. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Okay? So you got the sphere of the individual, the family, the church, and the state. Okay, so if the individual is bound by conscience, the family is bound by rules, the church is bound by the word of God, what is the, what is the state bound by? Well, the, the law, right? At least in a, in a healthy society, that's the case, right? And what informs it? Well, individuals inform it. Family units to some extent do it. Perhaps the word of God informs it in a, in a, in a godly nation. right? But what's the scope of a nation? So can a nation come into you and tell you how to discipline your family? <laughs> well, and, and really no, right? Now, can they come into a church and tell us what our worship service is supposed to be like? They try, well, well, no, right? As an individual, do I get to go to a Supreme Court justice and tell her how to do a ruling? Well, she doesn't answer to me. I'm just some guy, right? She's got, right? So the state is its own sphere of sovereignty. And you don't run a family the same way you run a state, right? So like if, if, my, if one of my little son, he has one a little cousin over and he punches the cousin, what are we going to do? We're going to throw him in jail. No. Right? I don't do that. Right? We talk about it. We work it out. Now, if by the time he's 25, he's still hitting his cousin in the face, well, now all of a sudden the state's going to step in there and they're going to say, okay, you guys have failed at your job. Now we're going to do ours. Right? So this is something he says, for the sake of Christ, submit yourself to the emperor, to the governors. Right? What's their scope? Their scope is to punish evil, commend what is good. Right? And they kind of pick up when the other areas have failed. We discipline the individual through habit, prayer, confession, humility. We discipline the family through discipline, uh, correction, encouragement. We discipline in the church through teaching, preaching, and accountability. And they discipline in the state through the judicial system. Okay? So you're kind of understanding, Jesus had said, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he says, I'm going to apportion authority to different groups, the individual, the family, the church, the state. There are probably other spheres of authority, but we're going to content ourselves with those four right now. And Jesus himself, what we will see as we look through the story of Jesus, he submits at each level. Okay? He submits himself individually to the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 4, we see a very brief, just a couple verses here will show us him doing this. So Jesus just got baptized by John the Baptist. That was pretty cool. Then Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. How many of you are, are like purposely signing yourself up for that, that diet program? 
right? Jesus submits himself individually to the Holy Spirit. There was no church leader told him to do it. His mom didn't tell him to do it. The state didn't tell him to do it. That was individually, he subjected himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit to go do something that was very unpleasant. But it doesn't stop there. Jesus submits himself to the family level. Right? So in Luke chapter 2, we learn about he's out with his family. They go to the temple, um, and he, he gets, basically sets himself up a part-time job, doesn't tell his folks. They're panicking, looking all over, for Jerusalem, all over Jerusalem, looking for Jesus, and they find him in the temple. And his, his mom asks him, his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And Jesus said, Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, right? So Jesus is busy about the father's business. Like, he's working in the temple. And his mom says, you're not ready for this. So even though his mom's hindering his kingdom work, he humbles himself and obeys his mother. Jesus subjects himself to the Holy Spirit individually. He subjects himself to the leadership of the, pa- of the family that he's born into. The church did not exist in this day, but we see Jesus submit himself to spiritual authority of his day. Matthew chapter 23 is a good example of this. We going fast, everybody? You guys notice we're going fast? We're going fast, all right. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. And they've got Moses' authority. They're setting up in the place God put him. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Jesus says, we need to submit ourselves to the spiritual leadership that's put over us, even though in this case it was corrupt. On the fourth level, he submits himself to the state. John 19, right before he's about to be crucified, the the government leader is really perplexed with this Jesus guy. Verse 10, he says, Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? What does Jesus say? You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Jesus submits himself individually to the Holy Spirit. He submits himself to his family. He submits himself to the spiritual leaders. And he submits himself to the state government. Even when, for those three levels, they were basically steering him in the wrong direction. Now, we have to be careful here. I mean, very careful here. Spiritual, spiritual, scripture is very clear. If you, at any of those levels, if your parents are telling you, don't you ever pray to that God, he's not real, whatever, you, you don't listen to that. If at the church level, we start saying some stuff that, that's not from the word and we start calling you into obedience that God didn't call you into, at that point, we've overstepped our bounds. If the state tells you, well, You're not allowed to assemble together as believers. Uh, You can't tell other people about the Lord. If they start saying things about how you must parent your children, or they start stepping over their bounds, you're not bound to obey that. But every lawful order from the Holy Spirit, from the family, from the church, or from the state, you and I are called to submit ourselves to it because that's how Jesus set it up. And, And why? You may say, well, why? Why, 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 why? It's a really good answer, really good question. Here's the answer. Jesus is going to come back someday. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to want you to be submissive in the family because he's your big brother and he's going to be in charge of the family. Uh, he's, going to be, he's going to expect you to be submissive in the church. Why? Because, well, he's head of the church. He's going, to, he's going to expect you to be submissive to the state. Why? Well, because he's going to be king of the state. So he, we are practicing here on earth what it's going to be like when Jesus returns and brings his kingdom here. Remember, heaven is not something for later. Heaven is not a, a retirement community in the sky. It is a kingdom that Jesus is going to bring here. And he's setting up the structures so that we'll understand how his kingdom is going to work later. Does that make sense? Okay. Everybody stand up. I told you we were going to go fast. Didn't I say we, did I lie to anybody we were going to go fast? Take a deep breath. You wave your arms. Wave your legs around. We're only halfway through, people. Woo-hoo-hoo. Woo. You do a couple, a couple of these. Anybody? Oh, 
I should have stretched first. Okay, so that was the teaching of the word. We learned about sphere sovereignty. You guys can sit down or keep standing up if you want. Whatever you want to do, that's fine. We're, we're running, everybody. We're not fooling around today. You think we're fooling around around here? But seriously, guys, like, I really hope that you will take these words and go home and study them and see if what I'm saying here is true. So we're going to be, uh, next, we're going to be in the Thessalonians. All right. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul's going to say something. You're going to say, what gives you the right to say this to us? And now you already know the answer, because fear sovereignty, son, that's why. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of who? The Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. And that in this matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish all those who commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Okay, we start off with an illustration. Several months ago, I was upstairs, and my boy Marky was in the bathroom getting ready for bed, and uh, I walk out, walk back in, and he's doing chin-ups on the towel bar. Context, um, we've replaced the towel bar, bar thrice now, because we like to do chin-ups on the towel bar. Come on in, I say, Marky, stop doing chin-ups on the towel bar. And he responds, and he says, well, it's my bathroom. Fair point. I guess you are the person that pretty much uses it. I never really use it. The towel bar does really only have one towel on it. It's his. He understands apparently that possession is nine-tenths of the law. I'm like, well, it's a fair point. And then I began to think a little bit further. I'm like, well, it's true. Yeah, you, this is kind of your bathroom. You do use this the most. Your stuff goes here. But, but I feel like I more so pay the mortgage than you do, Right? And I, and I kind of feel like I bought that towel bar after you broke the last one, and we hung it there together. Remember when we did that? Like, I bought the towel bar, and I hung it there. And yes, I do give you use of this bathroom because I love you, because I, it's more convenient for you, because it's a wonderful thing for you to have. So yes, it's your bathroom, but I still feel like I've got some influence in how things are done in the bathroom. Right? So he's right. But I kind of feel like I'm a little right too. He's right. I did give it to him to use. But it's still not his in that way. Right? When Paul starts talking about human sexuality, many of us will say things like, my body, my choice. We'll say things like, I was born this way. We'll say things like, you mean I'm supposed to, like, stay celibate? Wait, you're telling me who I can and can't love? Wait, you're fill in the blank. When Paul starts talking about your sexuality here, he's making some pretty direct claims of authority. And our culture today says, what gives you the right to talk to? What happens in my room is my business. And this, I think, is going to uncover this idea that we don't really understand whose we are. We don't really understand that all authority was given to Christ. We don't understand that within his spheres of sovereignty, he has delegated to the church 
the responsibility of preaching and teaching his word. And that that authority isn't to some guy in a red fleece. It's from Jesus Christ himself, so long as the church is preaching and teaching his word. The church speaks with the authority of God. I have this by preaching his word. You could almost cross out by and say when preaching his word. And what God's word shows us is that the Christians, I'm borrowing this from my good friend Bill Johnson, Christians live differently. Christians live differently. Look with me at verse 3 of that same passage. We're in 1 Thessalonians 4. Look at verse 3 again. It is God's will that you should be, what? Sanctified. Doesn't God want me to be happy? Sure. Doesn't God know that love is love? Well, he says, he says it's God's will that you should be sanctified. God cares more about our holiness than he does about our happiness. He says that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is what? Holy and, and, and honorable. He's saying, actually, yeah, you may be born a particular way, but you and I, as Christ followers have the responsibility to, through the Spirit's power, learn to control our own bodies. What does he go on to say? Look at the words himself. These are his words, not mine. Holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. The church, my friends, the church protects the holiness of God by living his word because we live differently. We are being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Does that mean that we're better than anybody else? Of course not. But within the church, we have the sphere of authority to speak into the culture and say, God has called us to be holy. We live differently. Now, many people say, okay, we're fine with the church stepping in and telling us, like, you ought not steal so much. You know, you're, we're happy to have like a, you know, God's way for parenting. We're fine to do all these kind of things. But once we start talking about human sexuality, all of a sudden they're like, hands off, man. We're interested in God's word up to a point. But when it starts poking at things that we want to do that make us comfortable, we're wanting to do chin-ups on the towel bar. And God's saying, yeah, like I gave you that body. Yeah, you're right. It's yours. It's, I've given it to you. But I still have say on how it's used. I still have say because I gave it to you. And I still have instructions for how you are to live with it. So this sovereignty that God has given to the church, this authority Jesus Christ claims, remember the the thing said, there's not one square inch of the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. He says, every aspect of heaven and earth are under the influence of Jesus Christ. And that is not exclusive, that's not limited. It even includes our sexuality. This includes the area of sexuality over which Christ claims lordship. Now, my friends, I'll be frank with you here. There is no topic like this one um, to bring up in some people, including myself at times, a feeling of hopelessness. Because the way that we are, to whom we're attracted, to what we're going to do for love and affection, like, love and affection is a true need that every human person has. Just like we need food, just like we need water, just like we need air, we need love and affection. That comes from a host of different ways. And to say that, well, you want me to learn to control myself in this area, am I signing up for a lifelong journey of misery, of dry toast? Like, is that, is that what we're doing here? For people, including some of the individuals that I've known, when they've seen that option, they say, 
to follow Christ and have to bring this area and have to bring this area under subjection to him or not I'm I'm going to go with not and I've seen people do that and I know I know that you have too and so I think that we need to be very clear that when we talk about what it would mean to bring ourselves under subjection of the Lord Jesus Christ in the area of sexuality, um, it's going to take more than what a human effort is going to be able to get done. Yeah. Uh, When Jesus goes into this 40-day fast led by the Holy Spirit, uh, he's going to be tempted there beyond what his human endurance will be able to manage. And so Jesus, in his example, shows us how we would ever, how we would ever become sanctified in that way. My friends, it will only be by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because our bodies, our bodies do cry out loudly for things that they want and desire. And this seems to be an impossible thing. It says in God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the pagans who do not know God. It's like, I followed God for a long time. The passionate lust seemed to keep coming. My friends, in order to obey Christ, there is no other way but to receive his Holy Spirit. I was reading a book last night before I went to bed written by uh, an author named Michael Casey and he was talking about this idea that when you walk with God for many years 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years he says when you get toward the end of a long walk with God he said your connection to God will be such and that time will almost take on this a sense of meaninglessness I'm here I'm there, this heaven thing. It's here, it's now, I'm with God. I'm not there yet. I'm still bound by this body, but I'm kind of in this spot in between. He paints this picture of what it's like to have this prayer of Jesus, this your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, beginning in our hearts. And we actually begin to taste and experience the kingdom the longer we walk by the Spirit, the longer we walk with God. It's not an invitation to a dry toast misery of a life. It's an invitation into walking with God so closely that as you begin to move closer and closer to heaven, the lines between heaven and earth begin to blur in your heart because of how close you're walking with God. Michael Casey happens to be a celibate monk for what it's worth. My friends, it seems like a mystery It seems like a mystery how we could ever overcome this. But what I know is that the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that empowered Jesus to withstand 40 days of temptation by the devil while starving to death out in the wilderness, that same Holy Spirit, he's given to you if your trust is in Jesus Christ. No change is impossible. No change is impossible with the Holy Spirit. Let's pray, my friends. God, our Father, we thank you by the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit for being our good God who understands us. Thank you that Jesus walked before us and showed us the way to go. God, it's so hard to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit, to submit ourselves to our families, to submit ourselves to the church, to submit ourselves to the state. You've called this submission, and Jesus did it in front of us. And so we pray that by faith we will grow in our ability to submit ourselves to the authority that you have put over us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My friends, over the next several weeks, we're going to be going in depth into the different areas of sphere sovereignty. We're going to spend two weeks on family. We're going to spend another week on government. So if you're wondering how all the sphere sovereignty stuff works out, keep hanging out with us over the next three or four weeks. We're going to go into much greater depth. Could you please stand if you're able so I can bless you? May the God of all creation, his Holy Spirit and his son Jesus be your constant companions. May you be filled with joy 
May you be sanctified. May you become holy as Jesus intends for us to. May you submit to that leadership that the Holy Spirit is trying to move within you. And may you have joy everywhere you go. Go in peace, my friends. Thank <laughs> you.